He's the last of the great leading men who dominated Hollywood after World War II. Kirk Douglas, now in his late 80s, overcame the devastating effects of a stroke to continue to act and write at an age when most men would simply stop. He was strong, he was pig-headed, he was stubborn, and he believed in what he was going to do. He was no BS. Kirk Douglas became a force in Hollywood both on the screen as an actor and off the screen as a producer. In the of the century. Like so many Americans, his family's fate was shaped by persecution and poverty. Kirk Douglas's parents were Jewish peasants who lived in fear of the Cossacks and the pogroms. When Kirk's mother saw her brother clubbed to death, America became a dream of salvation. After several years of saving and struggling, Bryna and Herschel Danielovich made their way to Amsterdam, New York, a booming factory town near Albany, and began a family of seven. Kirk Douglas was born Isser Danielovich on December 9, 1916. In America, the family name was shortened to Dembski, and Kirk was called Izzy. Amsterdam was full of opportunity, but Herschel Dembski was illiterate and had no skills and none of the local factories employed Jews. Herschel became a rag peddler, an occupation at the lowest rung of the social ladder. With six daughters and one son, he often had trouble keeping enough food on the table for his children. Kirk's mother kept an Orthodox household and observed Sabbath on Friday nights. Friday nights usually found Kirk's father, a rough and volatile man, holding forth in the local saloons story that I heard many times about his dad uh, being able to take a beer mug in a bar and actually bite a chunk out of it and just chew that chunk into a thousand pieces. Kirk and his sisters never knew what to expect from their father. One day Kirk went out to play and he split his head open on the bridge and he came home with gushing in blood and we were all hysterical and my father yelled at him so I think that hurt Kirk a lot. He expected his father to perhaps to comfort him. Instead, he yelled. A lack of love and approval from his father would haunt the ragman's son throughout his adult life. Kirk knew he wanted to be an actor even then, and at school, he went out for every play. The stage was one place he got the attention he craved at home. His family was coming apart at the seams. One day, the family gathered at the kitchen table, drinking tea. My father was breaking off a hunk of sugar and slurping the tea through the sugar, and he looked so big, so formidable. And the more I looked at him at the end, end of the table, I felt smaller and smaller until I thought I was going to dissolve. And I took a teaspoon of hot tea and I flipped it right into his face. Jesus, he was like a roaring lion. He reached across, he grabbed me, he threw me through a door, and I landed on a cot. But I didn't die. I survived. When Kirk was a teenager, his parents finally split up, and the children lived with and supported their mother. Despite his home life, Kirk was growing to be a gregarious and eager to please young man who was voted most popular by his classmates. Kirk graduated high school with honors. Like his father, he had trouble finding work because he was Jewish. Sometimes I'd say, well, I'm half Jewish. I felt that way, well, it's only you know, half as bad. And I remember a time one summer I got a job somewhere. I, I said, my name is Don Dempsey. I resented it, but I played the role. In 1935, he decided to take a shot at college. Kirk and a friend hitchhiked to Tony Private St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. Their last ride was in the back of a truck hauling manure. Before he had a chance to bathe, Kirk presented himself to the dean. He confessed that he had only $163 for tuition. Nevertheless, the dean was impressed with Kirk's determination and arranged for a college loan. His social life wasn't so easy. He wanted to join a fraternity and was rushed, then blackballed when the brothers found out he was a Jew. The rejection didn't seem to slow his campus ambition. 
Kirk threw himself into activities, especially theater. And he became the first president of the student body ever elected who was not a fraternity member. Actually, Kirk hated the class president's job, but he had proved he could make it even as an outsider. He graduated from St. Lawrence with many honors and few regrets. Kirk performed in Summerstock, where fellow actor Carl Malden helped him choose a stage name that would appeal to the American public. Izzy Dembski became Kirk Douglas. Then he set out to make that name known on Broadway. In the cold fall of 1939, Kirk arrived in Manhattan, flat broke, wearing the only coat he had, a thin second-hand raincoat that was a gift from a college buddy. Within months, Kirk won a scholarship at the prestigious American Academy of Dramatic Arts. There he encountered a pretty 16-year-old aspiring actress. I thought he was pretty snappy, I'll tell you, and he was. Lauren Bacall developed a bit of a crush on Kirk. And he was a waiter at Traft. I used to go there with my mother and order ice cream sodas and have him bring them to us. <laughs> she set out to befriend him with a gift. The only coat he owned was a raincoat, actually. He had no money at all. And uh, my uncle uh, had an extra overcoat. And so I prevailed upon him to give it to me so I could give it to Kirk. I said, he doesn't have anything. He has no money in love. And I carried this coat. He lived in a in a three-story walk-up in the village. And um, I brought him this coat. And he was warm from that day on. Kirk repaid the favor by attempting to seduce Bacall. He ruefully admits he failed. Kirk was dating another actress from a wealthy family named Diana Dill. But by 1943, America was in the middle of World War II. Kirk wanted to serve his country, and he joined the Navy. While still at Midshipman School, Kirk saw a copy of Life magazine. The model gracing the cover was his girlfriend from drama class, Diana Dill. He vowed to his disbelieving buddies that this was the girl he would marry. After several months and a rushed courtship, he did. Kirk never did see military action. In 1944, during a training exercise, he was wounded accidentally. He received an honorable discharge and headed home to join Diana who was about to give birth to their first child, Michael Douglas. With Michael's arrival, Kirk now realized that small Broadway roles wouldn't be enough to pay the rent, and he didn't want to rely on his wife. By this time, Kirk's old friend, Lauren Bacall, was turning heads in Hollywood, and, unbeknownst to him, doing good deeds for Kirk Douglas. She found herself on a cross-country train ride with a powerful producer, Hal Wallace. We were sitting in the club car and we were having a drink together and I said to Hal, I said, there's a marvelous actor, young actor in a play in New York and you've got to go see it. And he went to see it and he brought Kirk out to California for a screen test and cast him in a part. That part was in The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, co-starring Barbara Stanwyck, who was red hot after Double Indemnity. Kirk realized that for an unknown to be cast with Stanwyck was quite a coup, and quite a paycheck. He took the job. The young actor decided to give Hollywood a whirl, just for a couple of years. Little did he know, he would very soon become one of the most sought-after leading men in America. Nice. Your room, I mean long time since I've been here. Where were you? Getting drunk. Co-starring with Barbara Stanwyck in his first film in 1946, the unknown Kirk Douglas won critical acclaim and a contract offer. As I drank, I thought to myself, it, it's such a pity that my father isn't alive. To be able to see for himself all his dreams come true. The trademark jutting jaw, the dimple no plastic surgeon could have dreamed up, and the burning eyes and raw charisma of Kirk Douglas ate up the screen. The strange love of Martha Ivers made Hollywood take notice. It's one of those instant epiphanies that take place. You, producers and critics and audiences see a guy and say, who is that fellow? And, uh, and then they grab hold of him and, uh, and lift him to stardom. Kirk had talent. 
He had beauty. He had drive. And it's that package that's important. That persistence, that drive, that tenacity that really makes the star. Even though he needed the money, Kirk was stubborn and independent. He rejected contracts and also astonished friends by turning down a $50,000 offer on a big box office picture. Instead, he accepted a role in a much smaller, low-budget picture called Champion. With Champion in 1949, Kirk made one of the decisive gambles of his career. The film was a dark commentary on corruption of the soul in professional boxing. He was someone who was believable playing a man of power because he was personally a very powerful man. He was really good at playing really pretty dislikable guys. You're going to be a good little girl. Of course, if you aren't, I'll put you in the hospital for a long, long time. I got to change now. Don't be here when I come out. It was an anti-hero part, but you can't see Champion without having some kind of, of empathy, some kind of emotional connection to this, this guy who battered, beaten, torn apart, was still standing. I can beat him! You know I can beat him! <laughs> His stubborn choice had won him critical success as a film star, and Kirk Douglas received his first nomination for an Academy Award. When he was nominated for the champion, he went back to Amsterdam to see his father, and, you know, just his father same, well, yeah, you yeah, know, very kind of monosyllabic, didn't say much. He said, you see the movie? Yeah. What'd you think? Okay. And I think that lack of that confirmation is what has driven him, in large part, uh, his desire to succeed and to show and to prove. I think that's part of, the, part of the anger that he shows in a lot of his performances, too, comes from that. Kirk didn't win an Oscar that year. It was the first of many near misses throughout his career. But Kirk was winning the attention of his public. Douglas's masculinity appealed to male and female fans alike. He had it. I mean, he's very masculine and very attractive and clearly likes women and women sense that and respond to it. As well they should. And sometimes they shouldn't. Kirk was a married man, but his leading ladies often found him irresistible. By his own admission, he didn't put up much resistance. Numerous extramarital affairs were born on the set, and Diana Dill Douglas had no intention of tolerating it. Kirk and Diana now have two sons, Michael and Joel. She took the boys and moved back to New York. Kirk was building his fame and enjoying it considerably. He became quite the Casanova around Hollywood and was linked with starlet after starlet. Patricia Neal, Rita Hayworth, Jean Tierney all took turns. Kirk even had a liaison with Marlena Dietrich. In late 1949, Kirk and Diana Douglas were granted a divorce. It was surprisingly amicable, as they both knew they had married too young in the haste of the war. His children would become bicoastal, jetting between two different lives. The one thing he promised that he would never do would be to abandon his family like his father did, and had this tremendous need to to be a father, you know, and teach us, lecture us in about, you know, three days, three weeks, whatever it was. And it was a lot of pressure for him. Now Douglas was rootless and restless, and he continued to play alienated characters, making surprising choices for a leading man. Can't, can't look off your face. Kirk was also gaining a reputation for tapping into volcanic emotion. How do you know how I feel about you, how deep it goes? Maybe it's deeper than I want it to be. Maybe I don't want anybody to own me, you or anybody. Get out! In 1952, he further bucked Hollywood expectations by playing a ruthless studio mogul in Vincent Minnelli's The Bad and the Beautiful. Kirk deftly drew blood playing a Hollywood heavy with too much charisma for his own good. You're just not ready to direct a million dollar picture. You're stealing my picture. It was my idea. I gave it to you. Without me, it would have stayed an idea. Again, Kirk Douglas was nominated for an Oscar, and again, he lost. But by 1953, Kirk was flying high, 
money and women seemed to follow his every move. One woman who caught his eye was a worldly and lovely young Belgian woman he hired to do his public relations work. Kirk made a pass at Anne Guidens on her very first day on the set. Much to his surprise and chagrin, she was decidedly unavailable. And then that evening, my phone rang, and I heard this voice that I recognized immediately. I'm Kirk Douglas, and in all honesty, I said, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm so tired from my flight from America, I'm going to make myself some eggs and a piece of bread, and I'll go to bed, and I'll see you on the set tomorrow. And, of course, being the big, hot American movie star, he assumed that he could have anything he wanted, which most of the time was correct, until he met this woman that made it a lot more difficult than he was used to. And so the, the end result was it took a lot of work uh, to sort of finish her off. Anne Bledens was no ordinary bit of fluff. She had escaped Nazi Germany at age 15 and skillfully built her own career in film production. She was deeply determined not to be vulnerable to anyone. And I said, it won't happen to me, <laughs> being determined to be different. And it did happen to me. Kirk and Anne started dating, but she didn't want her feelings to get ahead of her. As far as she could see, Kirk was only serious about one commitment in his life, to his sons. But in 1954, when Kirk received word that his father, Herschel Danielovich, had died, he seemed ready to make serious changes. He invited Anne to come visit him in Los Angeles for a few months. She had been waiting for the call and joined him eagerly, expecting to leave when his children arrived for the holidays. He came one day and he said, I have to talk to you. My children are coming to visit me. And my heart sank. I said, yes. And he said, and I think it is better. And he stopped. And he said, and I think it is better for you and me to get married. <laughs> I nearly fainted. Kirk realized that in Anne, he had found a partner for life. Kirk had finally settled down, but that didn't mean he would stop taking risks. He wanted more control over his movies and more profit. The maverick actor decided to become a producer. But as his fame peaked, Kirk made the gutsy and unusual move of forming his own production company. He named it for his mother, Rhina. He wanted to be a producer because he wanted to control that picture. Now today, most big movie stars today want to do that, but he wanted to do it in an era when the studios totally controlled everything. So when he, when he cut the manacles to the studio system and moved outside, it was considered an act of, uh, of uh, absurdity. Uh, how, how, only, how could he be that dumb to do that? But he was the first. and. And then everybody else followed. As he was developing his career as a producer, Kirk Douglas, the actor, found a role he would inhabit. Lust for Life was the story of the tormented life of Vincent Van Gogh. You can learn something from him. You can learn control. I don't want control. I'm not afraid of emotion. When I paint the sun, I want to make people feel it revolving, giving off light and heat. He looked just like Van Gogh. I thought I was going to be lost in that picture because I didn't think anybody could compete with his performance. It was absolutely magnetic to see him working. I, I used to spend a lot of hours walking all over the hills and trying to find Gauguin for myself and find the same dedication to Gauguin that he had for Vincent Van Gogh. I watched this man possessed, and when he cut his ear off, in the mirror, my brother, my children just ran out of the theater screaming hysterically, and I was close behind, um, and we sort of totally lost uh, perspective. Kirk Douglas was nominated for yet another Oscar, his third, but again he lost. All I remember about being nominated for Oscars is not so much that I never won an Oscar is that I had such a beautiful acceptance speech and I never got a chance to give it. I think he should have won. I'm sorry that he didn't win it. I, I think it would, it would have been a wonderful thing for Kirk to have won the Oscar for that part because it was a part in which he believed with all his heart and soul. 
In the next five years, he would earn and lose another fortune and show Hollywood that if there were rules, Kirk Douglas knew how to break them. In the 1950s, Kirk Douglas was happily married to Anne, and in 1955, they had their first son together, Peter. Kirk's family life was thriving, but he was working like a madman and couldn't spend much time at home. He had this drive. He was worried that if he wasn't working, they wouldn't make any money and he would be poor again. So it was this fear that made him do sometimes three movies a year, sometimes three and a half movies a year which is unheard of. But Kirk was having a lot of fun, too. In 1957, he played Doc Holliday to Burt Lancaster's Wyatt Earp in the classic western Gunfight at the O.K. Corral. I see you in Dodge City and thank you properly. You can thank me properly by staying out of Dodge City. The film spawned countless Hollywood buddy movies and for Kirk, cemented a lifelong friendship with Burt Lancaster. A private, insular man Kirk had only a few intimates beyond his family. Kirk isn't a fella who opens his arms and takes you inside his soul easily. I think maybe, I don't know whether early on in life this was a shield that he used to protect himself from duplicity and uh, despair. In Burt Lancaster, the tough kid from Hell's Kitchen, Kirk recognized a kindred spirit. I've only got one debt in this world and I don't like owing it to you. As far as I'm concerned, you can get on your horse and keep riding. <laughs> no, thanks. I think I'll stay. By 1957, Douglas was proving to be a fine producer with sharp instincts for talent. A young unknown director named Stanley Kubrick offered him a controversial script. Paths of Glory was about the French military needlessly risking lives in World War I. Douglas made it in France until the 1970s. All in all, in the 1950s, Kirk Douglas was in the prime of his prolific career. He became one of Hollywood's biggest box office stars and became a millionaire. Or so he believed. Kirk had complete faith in his business manager. He and his wife were my husband's closest friend. He was my husband's uh, business manager, his lawyer, his father, his confessor, his all-around man. Ann Douglas complained to her husband that his manager did not provide an adequate accounting of Kirk's finances. Instead, Kirk would simply request cash as he needed it. Kirk would blow up whenever Ann pressed the issue. But Anne was protective of Kirk and not easily placated. She arranged for an independent audit. The findings were stunning. Kirk was deeply in debt. The Douglases owed hundreds of thousands of dollars to the IRS. It was terrible because it went back to the fear that he would be poor again. And so uh, uh, Kirk's earlier career really was ruined, I mean, financially. Kirk and Anne blamed their old friend and manager and Kirk demanded restitution, but he only collected a fraction of his loss. The sad business only steeled Kirk further against the world. You wish a thousand times that you were dead. <sighs> Kirk's financial troubles had come during the making of The Viking, a big budget epic he produced that was essentially a western. It wasn't exactly high art, but luckily for the Douglas family, the public loved it. Kirk was able to repay the IRS and start saving again. And in 1958, Kirk and Anne had their second son, Eric, a good Viking name for a little blonde boy. The success of the Vikings also established Kirk's company, Bryna, as a winner and gave him the freedom to make the movies he believed in. Making movies is not frivolous. If occasionally you can make a movie that has a, uh, an impact on people, even if you make a movie that takes people out of their problems for two hours, and for two hours they forget all their problems, the therapeutic value of that is enormous. Kirk then began rehearsals for another epic, 
the most important film of his career, Spartacus, the story of a slave who led a bloody rebellion against the ancient Romans. Kirk related to the story of the underdog who would be martyred for his cause. As the producer, he recruited the best draws of the day. Lawrence Olivier, Tony Curtis, Charles Lawton, Peter Ustinov, and, as his love interest, Gene Simmons. Kirk again hired 30-year-old Stanley Cooper to direct. The shooting was a massive undertaking. For a battle scene shot in Spain, Kirk borrowed an entire unit of the Spanish army. In hiring the legendary Dalton Trumbo to write the script, Kirk Douglas also altered the course of Hollywood history. The McCarthy hearings still cast a shadow over 1950s Hollywood, and Dalton Trumbo, like other writers accused of being communist, was blacklisted. The studios would not openly hire blacklisted writers. They could only work secretly using pseudonyms. There was a time where there was a lot of fear and and also the studio heads were frightened. And a lot of people's lives were ruined and a lot of jobs were lost. And it was a very bad time. After the film was made, Douglas and Kubrick debated what name should be used to credit Dalton Trumbo, the assumption being that they had to lie. Kubrick volunteered to take the credit, which annoyed Douglas. And they banded around several names, and finally Kirk looked up and said, Wait a minute. Let's put Stolton Trumpo's name. What are they going to do to me? Are they going to shoot me, execute me, give me a cigarette and a blindfold? This picture's made. Universal's going to put it out. I'm putting Stolton Trumbo's name on there. And he did. It was a very important step in breaking the grip of the blacklist on, on Hollywood. Uh, I think uh, Douglas was certainly a shrewd man, probably judged that the climate was shifting in such a way that he could make this act, but that's not to take anything away from the act. Kirk was risking a public boycott of Spartacus and isolation in Hollywood. He's got a lot of guts, Kirk. I mean, he's not afraid to try, you know, to do what this might be unpopular if he thinks it's right. Kirk had gambled his reputation, and it paid off. There was no significant backlash against Spartacus. Other producers soon followed his example. With one cut of a sword, he cut that Gordian knot, and the blacklist was over. The incident was emblematic of Kirk Douglas's approach to life as the ultimate outsider who could make Hollywood play by his rules. But in the next decade, Kirk was to learn he couldn't have everything he set his sights on. By the time Kirk Douglas was 40, he had developed a real reputation, both as a fine actor and as a producer who was ferocious on the set when he perceived any deviation from perfection. His devotion to his craft was paying off with hit after hit, and he was calling all the shots on films like Lonely Are the Brave and Seven Days in May. But one problem with success was that it meant spending much of the year on location, and that inevitably affected the kind of husband and father he could be. By necessity, his older sons usually visited him on movie sets. I mean, it's like living in the circus. Your life is uh, visiting your father on locations, on films, wherever he's been. I remember as a kid going, when they were there editing Psycho down the hall at Universal uh, when I was working for the summer there. We used to sneak down at lunchtime and look at the outtakes of Janet Lee from the shower sequences. Yet Kirk Douglas, Hollywood superstar, still nursed his early dream for acclamation on the Broadway stage. When he read Ken Kesey's novel about a revolt in a mental hospital, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, Kirk felt the lead role of the instigator, Randall McMurphy, was made for him. The McMurphy character, a sardonic outsider, wired like a ticking bomb, reflected Kirk's own mercurial temperament. Kirk would produce and star in the play, and then, he hoped, make the movie. The critics, however, saw nothing funny about lunatics making jokes and wrote murderous reviews. The play closed within months. Kirk temporarily put Cuckoo's Nest aside to pursue another challenge. 
Since he had so often been accused of directing his directors, he tried his hand at directing himself. Scalawag was a pirate tale with a circus theme. The script teetered perilously close to self-parody. A roommate of Michael Douglas's, young Danny DeVito, was cast in a minor role. Here, Peg. I made us a tally sheet. It was like a, kind of a strange combination of a movie because we had horses and we had the pirate ship and we had the, the parrot and the kid and the girl and the, you know, and the band of men. and the, You know, so it was a lot of stuff going on. The movie was all over the place, and so was the peck leg director. He's going to direct the movie, he's producing the movie, and star in it, he's going to do it with one leg strapped to his butt, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be like, so, and more energy and more, like, you know, positive force than anybody I've ever met in my life. To the relief of the participants, Scalawag was soon forgotten, and Kurt Douglas gave up directing. Yet making Cuckoo's Nest into a movie remained his obsession. But every time he got close, there were either legal problems or the financing fell apart. Kirk talked about it all the time. Michael Douglas was by now a TV star on the streets of San Francisco. But he also wanted to follow in his father's footsteps as a producer. He, too, was fascinated by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So I said, was a guy, I love this, I love this book. Why don't I take it over? I'll try to run with it. I'll try to get us to produce it uh, and try to get you to play the part. And he says, great. Kirk welcomed his efforts and was thrilled when Michael managed to secure financing. Kirk's dream of playing Randall McMurphy was within reach. But by 1975, Kirk Douglas was 59 years old, not the age most envisioned the mischievous Randall McMurphy. Michael Douglas, producer, agreed that a younger man, Jack Nicholson, should fill the role his father had waited more than a decade to play. A very, very, very difficult moment uh, for, for myself and for Dad, you know, who gave, who gave me this, and I think, I think he, he, he understood it uh, logically, but emotionally it was a difficult one to accept. Difficult to lose the role and to lose out on the Oscar Kirk still coveted. Jack Nicholson did win one for the role Kirk had championed. <laughs> How about it, you creep, you lunatic, mental defective? Let's hear it for Bull Goose Randall back in action night! At the 1975 Academy Awards, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, produced by Michael Douglas, walked away with five of the top Oscars. I think that Kirk was proud of that almost of anything he could be but I think somewhere in the deep recesses of his soul he thought that part was mine it should have been mine at least Kirk had invested in the film and he profited handsomely but even Kirk said he would have given back every penny he had made to play the part of McMurphy there were fewer and fewer interesting roles as Kirk grew older I never thought I'd see the great Harry Doyle turn into a doctor's script Keep it up, Arch. Put another hole in the chin of yours. But in 1986, Kirk was thrilled to star in Tough Guys, a buddy movie written just for him and his old friend, Burt Lancaster. Kirk was 70 years old at the time, but he didn't seem to know it. His energy was unflagging. When more good scripts weren't forthcoming, he found another outlet. At the age of 72, he became a writer publishing a best-selling autobiography called The Ragman Son. In the book, Kirk struggles to come to terms with his relationship with his father. But with its publication, readers learned more about his relations with women. Kirk wrote candidly about affairs before and throughout his two marriages. And while professing deep love and devotion to Anne, he wrote that man is not a monogamous animal. He gave me the galley story and he said, if there's anything in this book that bothers you, I'll take it out. And I thought about it and I said, no, you can't take anything out of there. You lived it. It's not anything that, I, that was greatly surprising me because I had imagined that these things would happen. 
and uh, I felt that he should leave it and I uh, I understood very well and I told him I said I'm grateful that there's only one book by then the Douglases had been happily married for a good 30 years but in the next decade they would need to draw on the strength of that bond more than they could have imagined At the age of 75, Kirk Douglas was finding joy in a new career as a writer. Then, on a trip to meet his editor in 1991, disaster struck. Immediately after takeoff, Kirk's helicopter collided in midair with a light plane, and both fell to the ground instantly. Anne and Peter Douglas rushed to the accident scene. When we saw the accident itself, flying over it in the helicopter was the first time that I really felt the bite that he might be dead because that runway was strewn with that helicopter and um, the plane had blown up in the air. <laughs> Two younger people were killed but Kirk, battered and bruised, survived. And they wheeled Kirk out of x-rays his face is totally black and I'm leaning over his bed and I said you know hi honey Kirk it's me and he opened his eyes and then he smiled and that's the only thing he remembers Kirk was shaken to his soul as he recovered from his injuries he began a spiritual search that would lead him back to his roots. Long non-observant, he embraced Judaism and began to study the Torah. Kirk also had to weather the storms in his son's lives. His son Eric was arrested and treated for drug abuse. In 1992, Michael underwent treatment for alcohol abuse. Then, in 1999, Michael's son Cameron was arrested for cocaine possession. But it was in 1996 that Kirk was dealt his most devastating physical blow. He suffered a debilitating stroke that robbed him of his speech. Mentally, he was as sharp as ever, but he would have to learn how to talk again. In that period of less than a decade, he probably had more experiences if you sort of balance it out in his own psyche than he had in all the preceding years put together. And I think that that period of time was his cram course in life. Kirk later confessed that the effects of his stroke brought him to the brink of suicide. Turn the clock back 30 years. I'm going to do just that. Yet Kirk persevered. Thank you, thank you. And in the year 2000, took on a role Taylor made for him in the movie Diamonds, which also starred his old friend, Lauren Bacall. And that year also brought him happiness when Michael married Welsh-born actress Catherine Zeta-Jones. Kirk has continued his writing career as well with My Stroke of Luck and Climbing the Mountain. Life was far from over for the former top guy as his dream of starring in a movie with his son was about to come true. Kirk Douglas had been reading a script for a movie he hoped to make with his son when he suffered his stroke in 1996. Michael promised Kirk he'd still make the movie whenever his father regained his speech. True to his word, Michael produced It Runs in the Family, which opened in 2003. It featured Kirk's first wife and Michael's mother, Diana. Michael's son, Cameron, also starred in a comedy about three generations of some very close men. Damn! Tell me you didn't just... Ah, schmuck! With Kirk Douglas, what you have is an actor who's really on the rush more of big stars. You could see his face chiseled in, in granite. Kirk Douglas's reputation as one of America's greatest movie stars was already secure. Just days before the stroke, he had learned that he was to be awarded the highest tribute by his peers, the 1996 Oscar for a Lifetime Achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, Kirk Douglas.
His appearance that night was a major achievement in itself. My tears were about the industry, the, his cohorts giving him a standing ovation. I truthfully felt it was long overdue. Um, I'm very defensive and protective of my father. I think, you know, he certainly deserves an Academy Award, not a Life Achievement Award. Kirk had been working hard on his speech therapy, but the family worried about his performance. They told him to simply say thank you and gracefully exit. But Kirk Douglas wasn't going to surrender the spotlight so easily. Thank you. I see my poor sons. They are proud of the old man. And I am proud too. Proud to be a part of Hollywood for 50 years. But this is for my wife, Anne. I love you. He secretly rehearsed all these lines, and he was very good. It was just unbelievable. I thank all of you for 50 wonderful years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He had started with less than nothing, but he had always believed anything was possible through the sheer force of his own will. And that night, all who were watching believed it too. <laughs>